My name is Murat and the purpose of this video is to just go fully in depth or fine tuning. <laughs> but yeah, this is fine tuning 101. The first thing that I want to talk about is why are you even trying to fine tune? Because are you trying to use it for a specific application that you got? Are you trying to automate something that you already have? Do you have an idea that you want to create? But the reason why I want to emphasize this is because a lot of people just want to throw out AI into whatever they are doing. That's not really how it works. There are some stuff that AI isn't that good at or it's kind of pointless to even utilize because it does get quite expensive when you are utilizing AI for a very long time. So try to understand why you are looking at fine tuning your application. And the best way to actually go about this is literally just sit down and think, what do you want your AI model to accomplish? So once you've clearly understood what you're trying to establish, then we're going to step number two, which is understanding whether or not your AI model is going to be a classification system or a conditional generation system. So a classification system is literally just used to distinguish between data. In other words, categorizing information to predefined classes. Conditional generation, on the other hand, is based on generating new content based on the input that you gave. So to properly understand this, we should probably go in depth into exactly what a classification system is and exactly what a conditional generation is about. A classification data set would, have, would be using a separator, which is literally just an indication of when the prompt ends. It will be using the rule of starting each completion with a white blank space. So just put a space bar just before you start your completions. It would have a unique identifier of when the completion actually ends. And the unique part about a classification system is you set the max token usage to one because it could either be in one class or another class. And to make sure that the classification model comes out as effective as possible, you want to make sure that the prompt and completions don't exceed 2048 tokens. And you also want to make sure you have about 100 prompt and completions per class. So if you have five classes, you should have about 500 prompt and completions, 100 per class. So just to get a better understanding, some example uses of a classification system would be to determine whether or not something is true and true or false, which is literally just the same as saying zero equals true, one equals false, and then depending on the output, that's how you determine if it's true or false. You could do sentiment analysis. So that could be done through saying zero is a positive statement, one is a negative statement, and two is a neutral statement. And you could also make this go a bit further and maybe do some emotional sentiment analysis. If you manage to get a list of 100 happy texts and you identify them as happy, and you, then, you can also, then you could say this is equal to number three. That, that way then you can look at whether or not a text is happy, positive, neutral, negative, sad, angry, and then you might be able to develop a system to reply depending on that analysis. And the final obvious way would be to just literally use the AI model for data organization. Now for conditional generation, you could, as you could see, the first three things are all pretty much the same. So the unique part about developing a conditional generation AI model would be to have about 500 examples of how you want the text to be outputted, depending on the input that you give it. OpenAI does recommend that you have lower learning rates and epochs. And the final way of making sure your data is good for conditional generation is to make sure that you use natural language within your prompts. And what I mean by that is, for example, let's say if you were doing a clothing store, instead of going hats equals 12, for example, if we're looking at the quantity of hats, it will be better to say there were 12 hats. And the reason for that is, I don't know, it's probably just because of the way the Da Vinci model was actually trained. And yeah, we just have to go by that. And some examples of conditional generation uses would be to number one, write a short essay maybe. Uh, one of the best ways that I would say everyone could, or businesses could actually utilize it is to make a unique chatbot to reply for them. Because nowadays, a lot of the chatbots online that use natural language processing are just pretty much just generic chatbots. And they don't really have a unique specification, which I'm sure would make a big difference when dealing with customers. And another really, really popular way of using conditional generation is for copywriting and, and developing copy marketing. So for some quick tips and tricks when doing your prompt and completions for your data sets would be to make sure that your prompt and completion 
are not using a separator that is used within the prompt and completion itself. So make sure, in other words, that a separator is unique. For example, you wouldn't really want the letter A to be a separator because it would probably appear a shit ton within your prompts. So a unique separator might just be like a space for space for hashtag hashtag. Or it might be a bracket hashtag close bracket. Or it might be bracket A equals 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 capital D close bracket. It depends on you essentially what you want the separator to be. There shouldn't be too much of an impact on individual separators and how they effectively influence the performance of your AI model. And the second thing that you can actually do is just ask ChatGBT for example prompts based off of what you want your AI model to do. And this is pretty much as simple as just going to ChatGBT and writing, can you write me a list of prompts for X, Y, Z? For example, you can just go up to ChatGBT and ask it to write you a unique set of prompts that are specific for writing copy for dentist companies. And then this way you just over time develop, I guess, a copy business that is unique to dentists now i was going to do a run through together but i made a separate video for that and i think the link should be on the screen and if it's not on the screen just check the description but yeah the run through is going to be me going through how to develop a ai model that's like a chatbot but it literally types like you and it gets all the information essentially from a, your whatsapp data and yeah, and now you can just basically just sit and not type anymore and just reply to your friends and family. <laughs> That's best sad, isn't it? <laughs> yeah, one thing that I struggle with trying to get my head around when learning about fine tuning is all this hyperparameter shit. So the hyperparameters are literally just used to make your model more efficient in whatever it's trying to do. Now, OpenAI doesn't really force you to develop and use these hyperparameters because they have all the default values. But if you are try if you are a business, for example, and you want to give the best possible service to your customers, it might be quite useful to learn about hyperparameters. And yeah, so just to quickly get into them, the learning rate, which we talked about before for the conditional generation as well, is basically how quickly the model learns from the data. Now, you might be sitting there thinking, why the fuck would you not just have this at maximum so it learns as quick as possible? But no. The reason why you don't want that is because this would mean that for each data that it iterates through, it would basically drastically change the outcome of that model and how that model operates. So just for more clarification, so what the learning rate multiplier essentially does is adjust the value of the weights during forward propagation and backward propagation. AI models have neural networks, right? So a learning rate multiplier, if it's higher, what it means that if this value is five and the learning rate multiplier is going to be, let's say, I don't know, two, this value is now 10. So it's learning times two the speed. So in other words, the learning rate multiplier, the higher it is, the more aggressively it learns the training data. Now this would mean that the network would literally memorize the training data to its maximum and would potentially then struggle when is imported with new data and in machine learning terminology this would be called literally just overfitting the model so the second hyperparameter will be the number of epochs and a number of epoch is literally just the number of times that the training data goes through within the ai model now the difference between epoch and iteration is that iteration is each individual data and how many times they go through the model and epoch is how many times the whole training data goes through the model. Now the third hyperparameter would be the batch size. The batch size is literally just the number of data that goes through within one iteration. So in layman's terms, the AI model goes back to adjust its weights every single time after each iteration to adjust the weights to make the AI model a lot more accurate, right? And the AI model would adjust these weights based off of the subset of data that it had to work with during the iteration. And the size of this subset of data is what is known as the batch size. So you might be thinking, why the fuck does batch size matter? A large batch size would most likely cause for a faster training model to be processed. It would allow for more data to be processed in parallel and at the same time. But at the same time, this could cause for there to be a lot of overfitting again in the whole AI model because now you're conjugating a lot of the data together. A smaller batch size could mean that there is going to be better generalization because 
you are essentially going through a lot more different subsets of data however it will cause the training process to be a lot slower and potentially return less precise results now the fourth thing would be a prompt loss weight so a prompt loss weight is literally just how much the ai model should focus on learning the prompts in and of itself for example in my case when i was creating the chatbot for myself i learned that it was in that case very important to learn what the prompt was actually saying and wanting to do so in this situation a prompt focus slightly higher might be beneficial for the ai model this is literally just dependent on the ai model you're trying to create if the prompts that you're given the ai model are very specific and detailed and genuinely matter then it might be better to have a higher prompt focus however if your prompts are generic and don't really have a precision to them then it might be better to have a lower prompt focus this way the output of your data would either be more specific because it's very specific to the prompts or it'll be more generalized because it's less focused on the prompts in and of itself so the final hyperparameters focus solely on developing a classification ai model so one of them would be to compute classification metrics so this is literally mainly done to analyze the performance of the ai model and it would give you an f1 score which is literally just a mean score of the model's precision and the recall of it so the precision is literally just the number of positives that the ai model said it has and the actual number of positive classifications that the ai model has and a recall would be the number of true positives divided by the number of actual positive samples so in layman's terms a high precision would mean that the model has a few false positives while the recall would mean that the model has a few false negatives now i wanted to quickly go through some of what openai's recommendations were when using these hyperparameters and the first one is that for conditional generation a lower learning rate and one to two epochs tend to be better so to properly understand this is basically saying when you're when you want your ai model to generate content for you based off of the input that you give it which is conditional generation having a lower learning rate which means that the ai model wouldn't be absolutely dependent on the training data that it's given and it will be more likely to give a generalized response it will be better because within conditional generation you want to give the ai model some freedom to essentially develop answers on its own and the reason why you would want one to two epochs is because a lower set of epochs means that the ai model is going to go through the same training data a few more times and this way the ai model will be less determined by the training data and actually be able to provide more unique responses to you <laughs> the second one of open ai's findings is that a higher learning rate performs usually better with higher batch sizes so in layman's terms a higher batch size would mean that you you <laughs> you are able to have a more stable rate of change and because of this it the model is capable of handling a higher learning rate so the higher batch size makes the learning rate more stable because there's essentially more data per iteration so then this means that it could handle higher learning rates and when you put the two together it makes the ai model stronger the third point that a open ai made was a large batch size usually works better with larger data sets and this is pretty self-explanatory because with larger data sets you would essentially be able to make the ai model have significantly more stability during its training process one of the main points that open ai makes is if you are fine-tuning a fine-tuned fine ai model already the best bet would be especially if your data set is now smaller the best bet would be to make sure that the learning rate is smaller so the reason for this is because you, your ai model is already trained and it already basically knows what to do and you don't want to significantly change its behavior based off of the new data set final page that i wanted to talk about is which model do you want to choose for your ai model and when i was doing this research i actually came across a shit ton of models and i don't think it will be useful to just put all of them into this video so let me know in the comments below if you want me to go through each ai model that could be fine-tuned individually a and i'm talking about fine-tuning ai models that could generate image video 
audio, text, and looking at essentially the ones with the highest performances. So yeah, I really appreciate you guys sticking around and watching. I hope you learned something. I certainly did. The reason why I do all of this anyway is to be able to learn myself and teach you at the same time. Yeah, thank you. Bye. <laughs>